us a channel of your peace. There is hatred, let us love. Where there is hatred, let us love. Where there is wrong, let us forgive. Where there is wrong, let us forgive. Where in the pain there's been enough. Lord, help us be your love. See you here. Help us see you here. The peace that finds oppression in our world. A channel of your presence. There is darkness. Make us light. There is sadness. Make us joy. Foster, just wait right here. I want you to stay. We're going to pray, so uh, you may stand up again if you can. Uh, my name is uh, Louis Carlo, and I'm with NIAC, Alliance Theological Seminary, and I'm on the board of directors. I got my posse here. Where, where are my dogs at? <laughs> All right. <laughs> I, I, uh, and I'm a board of uh, director member of CCDA, and I want you to grab somebody by the hand. Amen. 
I, I believe that uh, we heard, we've been hearing from the Lord, amen? amen? And we heard a good word today, and I see a mantle, a prophetic mantle that is falling on top of Dr. Perkins. That's my observation. I'm not imposing it on you. I'm sharing with you. And I think that as God leads CCDA into a new era, we need to pray that we can follow that leading. Amen? And we need to internalize that. And so I, I, I was gripped yeah. by that word. Uh, how long, Lord? My heart cries out. Uh, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things, Lord? And I believe that we need to pray with intelligence, with knowledge, and in the spirit. So let us pray this morning and join me. I'm not leading. I'm praying with you. Amen. God of heaven, we cry out. Lord God, as Habakkuk did, Lord God, in days of old, we cry out, O oh God, as our faith grapples with the problems of the world, Lord God, and we ask you, how long, Lord God? We ask you to rise up as a dread champion and intervene and reveal yourself on our behalf. You see CDA in a new dimension, in a greater way, Lord God, Dr. Perkins, a Dr. Gordon uh, Murphy or uh, Dr. Wayne Gordon uh, Noel Castellanos, all of the leadership my God, use them use us that we may be aware of what you're doing and saying in the world today oh God, we need you like never before, we thank you Lord God, because hitherto for you have been with us but Lord we are excited and wait with great anticipation to see what the Lord will do, such forth your arm, O oh God, and Lord, rise up, O oh God, in a mighty way. Use us, and we will give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise, all the accolades. We say hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God on high. And Lord, now we pray for Dr. Coach. Use him, O oh God, in a mighty way, that he may speak to our souls in in the name of Jesus, we pray and thank you, and we ask these things in faith believing. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. One more thing I'm a Latin from Manhattan. Before you sit down, hug somebody. Amen. Down here, it has a real bad reverb echo. So close at your mouth. Okay. All right, stay standing, though. Stay standing. Does this have a thing to put my books on underneath it? Yeah. This is all I need, because I, I can put my books under here. Oh, oh okay. Okay, okay, good. Okay. All right, we were supposed to have some come out music. We were going to dance and everything. We we're going to have Welcome to Miami, um, but that's not going to happen. So, I need you to get excited about Miami, though. Is anyone excited about Miami next year? <laughs> All right, well, as some incentive, of course, we've got another free giveaway, and they've got some nice, colorful shirts this year for next year. Now, if you want this shirt, I need to hear you. I need to hear you. I want to see the most excited person in the house. All right, all right. All right, all right, all right, all right. Oh, interception. All right, now, where is my brother Dylan at? Where is Dylan at? Oh, there you go. All right, well, I got clowned on yesterday for having for throwing like a girl. But mind you, I was throwing with my left hand, and T-shirts are hard to throw, okay? Well, I got some reinforcements. Dylan's got some strong muscles, and he's going to uh, give the, the giveaways out. And he is from Y Men Ministries from Lawndale. And uh, Dylan, who do you think deserves a, a hat out there? We got we, we to gotta hear people. We can't see you very well, so we got to hear you. All right, well, Dylan, I'm going to leave it up to you. Why don't you throw some hats out there? These hats are on sale. One for $15. All right. Uh, two for $25 and three for $30. So make some noise. Make some noise. All right, we got one. They're embroidered hats, and you can get them personalized. So please go check out the Wyman booth at the back there. All right, we got two left, two left. Who wants the last one? You guys scream loud, loud, loud. All right, good job. Thank you, Dylan. Let's give Dylan a warm applause. All right, well, you can take a seat. 
Now, um, I know we got your energy up, and if we have some experienced salsa dancers in the house, we need you to be here at 4 o'clock today, here in the ballroom, because we need you to be our helpers uh, today, tonight when we have our salsa dancing. Are you guys ready for that? Are we going to have a big turnout tonight? All right. Well, if you're an experienced salsa dancer, please meet us here at 4 o'clock. Also, if you are wanting to sing in the mass choir tonight, also be here at 4 o'clock to help us sing and practice. Uh, where are young people at? All right, being young is relative, so if you're young at heart. All right, well, the young people get a bad rap. They say that we can't wake up on time. I, I'll admit I'm a night owl. I, I go to sleep late, and I like to sleep in. But if you are a young person, that's up to you to decide. Um, we are going to be meeting at AJ's tonight, AJ's restaurant downstairs to network. Um, we're sorry, but the bar will be closed. I know that some of you West Coasters are a little dis disappointed. But... Um, <laughs> We will be meeting tonight at 10.30 after the salsa dancing. Um, also, we thought that the ministry tours were full, but the North City Ministry Tour still has 15 seats available. You have to go to the registration booth before noon today in order to register. They will give you a ticket so you can participate in that tour tomorrow. Um, on a more serious note, Yesterday, a brother named Jackson Nelson, who is here visiting from Haiti, who came with Jimmy Dorrell, he uh, suffered a stroke yesterday. And so we need to be in prayer for him. Uh, the right side of his body right now is paralyzed, uh, but he is alert. He's in the hospital right now. Um, and it'll be another three days before they know the full effects. But please be in prayer for him. Um, his family was set to return to Haiti on Sunday. Uh, but because of this, their travel plans may be delayed, and they may run, run into uh, visa issues as well. Um, we need some people who are here in St. Louis to step up and help with the family. Uh, they may need a, a place to stay, and they need, <coughs> might need some uh, ministry help. So if you would contact Jimmy Durrell at 254-214-4933, 254-214-4933, um, and get in touch with him so you, can, you, you or your church could help out with that family. <coughs> Lastly, we have another regional networking session today at 11.30. So after this session, please see an orange handout. If you got one, that means you were late because you got one at the door. Um, but on your way out, you can also get another orange sheet, and it will show you where you need to meet for your regional networking times. And again, we encourage you, associate. This is a Christian Community Development Association. All right. Well, Coach needs very little introduction. So let's just show some love for Coach Wayne Gordon. Well, it's, uh, we are off to a wonderful start, and as we spend these next few moments together, one of, the, one of the great joys of my life is being part of CCDA, and from the bottom of my heart, I want you to know how thankful I am that you're here, and every one of you here is very, very important. Uh, you may be here for the first time, you may have been here every conference and maybe you haven't been asked to do a workshop or maybe sometimes it just seems like uh, you, you're not quite fitting in you may be the person that we need the most here this is an association we need each other we're working together and I think is uh, JP has probably never been on his game better than he's been at these two morning Bible studies I mean it, it this stuff that John is talking about is so powerful and CCDA we're getting ready to be 20 years old but you know when we're be, be, being a little bit older sometimes we might think we've got it together a little bit but you know what we are still such learners in this process and that the moment we think that we have a corner on reconciliation or or on what God's truths are that's when we will really falter and it's so important for us to be deeply rooted in the Word of God. I, I see my major responsibility as, as one of the leaders of CCDA is to help us not necessarily to work so hard at being profound. I have nothing profound to say today. But to help us be grounded into what God is leading us to do and what God has led us to do. Now, it's amazing what happens in Christianity. This summer, I read a book. It's called Jim and Casper Go to Church. Now, let me give you the context of this book. 
It's not one that most of you have read. I'm sure probably very few of you have read this book, and you may not need to go read it. It's, I'm not advertising the book. But what's, what's significant is this book, Jim and Casper, Jim is a Christian, Casper is an atheist. And so what happens is Jim goes out and he hires an atheist to travel around America and visit churches in America. And then they have a dialogue together, and that's what takes place in this book. Now, interestingly, in one of the, they visited 12 churches, and one of the churches is, is, a, is a CCDA church. And uh, let me read you just a portion of what is stated in this chapter that I think helps us understand something. It talks about this church, and it says, really, this church is more an extension of a movement called the Christian Community Development Association, CCDA. The CCDA is a group of Christians led by John Perkins who practice not the three B's. Most churches practice the three B's. Budgets, buildings, and butts in the seats. All right? <laughs> so that not so much, this church was not one that so much that practiced the three B's, but they practice what they call the three R's. Relocation, reconciliation, and redistribution. Then, over on the next page, it says, now, at this particular church, it says, there was no altar, no traditional altar was there. No camera cranes, no fog machines, no waterfalls. Well, this is my favorite line. But plenty of water stains, however, on the carpet. And lots and lots of people filling the rows of chairs. Now, let me read to you what this atheist says. He's talking about, does God exist or not? He says, however, to someone like me who doesn't believe there is a literal God, or that we're going to meet someday up in the sky, a God that can't be proven otherwise. He comes clearly at that perspective. But then he says, well, to me, proof of good deeds like they deliver here at this church count more than anything. That's evidence that you are following what anybody can read in the Bible. This is an atheist talking. Love thy neighbor. Turn the other cheek. Judge not lest you be judged. Now let me get this straight, Jim, the Christian, says to Casper. He says, I said to Casper, you're saying that this church is providing the kind of compelling evidence that someone could reasonably be pointed to as evidence of a God being active in and through people. Yeah, Jim, I am. If you don't have goosebumps right now about a CCDA church in your movement that an atheist says by their actions and the way they're loving each other is compelling evidence that there is a God. And I'm also saying that even though I don't believe in God, but listen to this. I see evidence of the idea of God being a good thing and a great thing right here in this community. CCDA. John has often said, and those of you that have heard John talk before, you've said that, you know, one of the things, one of the stories of Zacchaeus is that, yeah, you know what? People say, well, what about the rich? What about the affluent of our society? You know what John often says? He says, we will reach the wealthy, we will reach the rich... When we reach out to the poor, and they will come to us. I think Jim and Casper are somewhat compelling evidence for that. Now, what's very important for us is that I want to make sure, today I want to talk to you about the basics of Christian community development. That's the theme of what we want to spend a little time with. And if we're going to do that, you know that, uh, that it, we need to, John and I are doing a workshop this afternoon on the eight key components of Christian community development, but you know, it's so important for us to have and understand the eight key components of Christian community development. Hi, my name is Paris, and the first component is relocation. Living among the people transforms you, them, and theirs to we, us, and ours. Um, my name is Terrell, and the second component is reconciliation. People to people, people to God. Love God and love your neighbor.
Hi, my name is Anthony, and a third key component of CCDA is redistribution. Just distribution of resources, working for justice in underserved communities. Hi, my name is Ashley Carter, and the fourth component of CCDA is leadership development. Raising up from Christian leaders from the community who will remain in the community to live and learn. Hi, my name is Monique, and the fifth key component of CCDA is listening to the community. The priority is the thoughts and the dreams of the community itself. Uh, my name is Chris, and the sixth component of CCDA is church-based. It is also the responsibility of the church to love their neighbor and their neighborhood. Hi, my name is Paisley, and the seventh key component of CCDA is holistic approach. Tackling the spiritual, social, economic, political, cultural, emotional, physical, and moral, judicial, educational, and familial issues of each person. Hello, my name is Javiana. Hello, my name is Katrina, and CCA component Come number eight is yeah. empowerment. There I'm must be an opportunity for people to get their needs met. The person who had a need must be willing to work for it. When these are working a person's dignity, it is affirmed. Hi, my name is Pam McCain, and these are the eight components of CCDA. You must live among the people. You must be reconciled. You have to share. You need to lead, listen, honor God, respect everybody, and be empowered. Amen. Amen. You keep holding it up and it off. Just stay out here. All right, as you can see, all of these uh, young people that are up here, on the back of their shirt, if the camera didn't quite pick it, they have number six, Chris has, church base. Paisley has over here holistic approach and empowerment. So each of the young people, and young people, come on up. We have some other young people from Lawndale that are here with us. And the, today, the first thing that we want to talk about, this is Jamila and Sarah and Jordan, Theo and Antoine, so you know all of their names. And there's Jeremy and Crandall and Johnny. Come on all the way up here. All right. are some of the young people, these are just some of the young people of Ondale who happened to come with us. And the, the, the ones that showed us the eight key components, they did a little CCDA project and that's how they got to come today. And in doing their CCDA project, they took a block on our neighborhood, just right down the street from the church. You can throw in a baseball to it from my office. And they took this block and they said, let's, let's, let's canvas this block and let's try to figure out what it means to have a block club. So they went to every, they interviewed 40 different families on that block. Now when young people come to your door, you're not so afraid of them. When the Jehovah Witnesses come, you won't open the door, all right? They got the doors open for them and they began to talk to the people. It turns out that even on this block there had been a block club and there was an existing block club, but many of the people weren't coming. And so they did this study, they did this project as a part of their own leadership development and then they put this together. They made these t-shirts themselves and these are some of the blocks, Ridgeway and Terrell has on Springfield, which is the street you were on, right? and uh, Cermak for Paris, and so they, they have them ones. These are young people who are in our church every Sunday. They're making a difference. They're involved in our youth group, and this is what we call the first point I want to talk to you about today as what's basic about Christian community development is that we have to be developers of indigenous leadership. 
Now, whatever you do and whatever is going on in your ministry, we have got to be sure that we are committed to developing indigenous leaders for our community. And it's not something that comes all that easy. It's not something that just happens overnight. It has to be intentional. You have to be committed to it. And you've got to go through whatever pains and hard things there are. Now, this, this is the future of Lawndale. It's not about me or anyone else. This is these young people people here will, will make a difference in the Lawndale 10 years from now, 15 years from now, and what at the time in the future. But it is so important for us to be intentional. Indigenous leadership development is one of the linchpins. Of course, it's one of the eight key components. And as we think about what those eight key components look like, it's so important for us not to leave out. It is so easy for I just spent, and many of you were in this seminar, but I spent about five or six hours doing one of our institute classes. Now, we have an institute class on every one of those key components. And every one of them are important, whether they be church-based, whether they be reconciliation, whether they be indigenous leadership development, every one of those, empowerment. We have an institute class that runs somewhere, depending on our time, between six and eight hours to help you. We are putting these all over the country, and we hope that you will come so that you can understand. On our website, we have all of the eight key components that are there. But the first thing I wanted to mention to you that is so significant is that when you go back home, I don't understand why you come and not bring a young person with you from your community at the CCDA conference. When you come next year to Miami, don't come alone. Don't come alone. Bring, bring with you a Jordan. I told Jordan I wasn't going to make her talk. And I told Jamila and Sarah I wouldn't either. But I... But let me tell you, you know what is a rewarding thing for me? Come on up here, Dad. And is Mom here too? Come on, Mom. Come on, Mom and Dad. I'm talking about you, Stacy. I'm talking about Joe. Come on up, Joe. Right here. Now, this is Jamila and Sarah's uh, Mom and Dad, all right? This is Stacy. This is Joe, all right? Now, those of you that know the Lundell story... This is how it works. The Lawndale story is JoJo was on my wrestling team. I met JoJo back in 1975. And Joe was a student at Farragut High School. And he started coming to Bible studies. And then Joe was in the Bible study with Ann and I. And JoJo was along with about another half a dozen kids. Had this idea to start a church. Remember, the Lawndale story is not about Ann and myself. It's about the JoJo's of the world. Now, JoJo, when he was in high school, he and a few others had this idea to start a church, and a church, this was before CCDA, we didn't know what these terms were. But he said, let's start a church that's going to reach out and love our neighborhood. Let's start a church that's going to make a difference in our neighborhood. Let's start a church that will break down the barriers so that people who don't go to church will come to church. Now, the unbelievable thing is now Joe has come up from a little high school young person and gone on in life, gotten married to Stacy in 1996, all right? I remember that day. That was a good day. They jumped the broom. At our church, we have people often jump the broom. They jumped the broom in their service, all right? They even did a little dance. We ain't got time to go into all that. I know my time is running here. But anyway, you see, what's, what's amazing then, they get married. Now they own their own home. And then they had these two beautiful children. I'm not going to make you talk, Sarah. I promise. <laughs> but see, then, and now, Joe, Stacy's gone on. She's a nurse. She works at the emergency room at the University of Illinois Hospital. And Joe is my associate pastor. When I'm not in Lawndale, Joe is in charge. And now, here are their children growing up in our neighborhood. And so if you can see this, I told Pastor Bernard, I said, you thought you were something with that chalkboard, all right? Wait till you see what I got tomorrow morning plan. Because this is the picture of what Christian community development is all about. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't say one other thing. Every once in a while, it's okay to be proud. All right? And I am proud 
that I can say I've been married to the same woman for 30 years. And this woman has walked with me and taught me, and, and come on up, my lady. I know she don't want to. Thank you. This is my wife, and you haven't met her. 30 years she put up with me. 30 years she's worked to make me right, and, for, and, and it was in that Bible study with girls that Anne helped the girls, and the girls had the same idea as the boys' Bible study that year back in 1978. We're getting ready to celebrate 30 years as a church. And, of course, Sarah Elizabeth is so special to us, but this is Jemila, and guess what her middle name is? Jemila Wayne. Give me five, Jamila. All right. But you know, whether, whether your name is Johnny or Crandall or Jeremy or Antoine, it doesn't matter who you are. These are the young people. And I hope you, back in your community, have young people like this that you are pouring your life into, that you know personally, and that you love dearly. So indigenous leadership development is my first point. All right, thank you so much. I don't know. Take it, take it over there. All right, I'm going to have to work hard to get my other points in. But I think it means it's, it's important to make that point. And what I want to do right now is I want to just share with you what I believe are the basics of Christian community development. And I, I'm going to go through them fairly quickly. But it's, I think it, these, are, these are things that it's very, very important. We will not succeed if we're not doing these things. The first one that I already mentioned is developing indigenous leadership. Now, the second one that is so important is that if we are going to do Christian community development, we must be deeply devoted to God. We have got to be people who are deeply devoted to God. As it says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. So my second point for us this morning is that we must be deeply devoted to Christ. We have to out-Christ everyone we know. When somebody looks at us, they, might, they must know that we are righteous. They must know that we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And it takes time to do that. We must have that same desire that the Apostle Paul said, that I want to know Christ, and I want to know him in the power of his resurrection, but I'm also willing to share in the suffering. I want to know Christ. I had a confession to our deacons the other night. We're studying the book of Philippians at Lawndale right now, and I've probably read the book of Philippians through about 50 times in the last couple months. And when I get in that chapter 1, around verse 21, it says, for me to live as Christ, to die is gain. I told our deacons at a deacon meeting, I said, I don't love God like that. I don't want to die. I want to stay alive. I like things on this earth too much. And I know, as your pastor, I've got to go deeper in my walk with God that I am so close to God that the things of this world are nothing I want to hold on to. The things of this world are not something I aspire to. Even though I'm having so much fun as a pastor, even though I'm having so much fun as a Christian community developer, I want to be so committed to Jesus Christ that I can say for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. I want to go home to be with my Lord. We have to spend time alone with God. How much time do you spend alone with God? We are activists in CCDA. We are doers, and we are doers of the Word of God, and that's fabulous. But we also have to be beers in Christ. We must be in Christ, and we must spend quality time. We must have a deep, deep love for Christ. And as we have that deep devotion to Jesus Christ, then other things will come along. Let us not neglect our own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Spend an hour alone with God every day. Spend a day, a month, 
in solitude and silence with God. Don't let the busyness of the ministry. I'm telling you, it'll be there tomorrow. Tom Skinner talked to us years ago about the monster of ministry. And once you get two or three staff people, you're already a monster. And the larger you get, the harder it is to be deeply devoted to Jesus Christ. And you as the leaders have got to set the tone for that. So we cannot neglect our walk with God. The third, the third idea that I want to think with you about is what I'm calling directive. We must have a directive to do Christian community development. We must be directed, and this is the word I'm using as a call. We must be called to do Christian community development. There must have been a directive in our life. John this morning talked about some of these directives. He talked about how God called Jonah to do something. God calls us to do things, and often we may not want to do it, but God calls us to do Christian community development. We must have a calling from God. We must sense God's calling. As Jeremiah says in the beginning of Jeremiah, that's the kind of call we're talking about. The word of the Lord came to me saying, but before you were in, while you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Ah, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I'm too young. I'm too white. I'm too ignorant. I'm too arrogant. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. I am uneducated. I'm too wealthy. You must go to everyone I send to you and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. And then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth, Jeremiah said, and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over the nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. We must sense God's calling to do Christian community development. We must sense God's calling to racial reconciliation. And I loved it what John was saying this morning. I mean, I can't, I can't, I just can't, I just can't miss the words that John says. I love that he says, you know what? We cannot become complacent here in Christian community development about this race. You look around and we've got all kinds of people of color that have joined all kinds of white people in our society here. And yet, That is not racial reconciliation. Just because if you look around and you can see a person of color or a white person close to you and you can call them by name, that's not reconciliation. Tomorrow morning, we're going to have a deep discussion with two people who are in a relationship, Leroy and Andy, and have been in a 10-plus year relationship here in St. Louis. And we're going to have a conversation tomorrow morning that goes a little below the surface of how it's really hard when we get honest about, I can't stand you. You get on my last nerve. (laughs) Then, when you can say that to somebody, then you're you're on the way to having a little reconciliation. (laughs) But all this drinking coffee together and slapping five and having jokes and oh yeah, ain't this cool, that is not reconciliation. And you know what? I think we are in danger here at CCDA. I really do. John and I have been talking. I think we're a little bit in danger that it just looks so nice here that maybe we're a little bit like Hollywood where we got some props up here and it looks all so good. But if we go underneath the surface, are we as blacks and whites and Latinos and Asians, are we really loving each other? Are we really being reconciled? It took Phil Jackson, who's going to speak on Saturday night. It took Phil one day years ago to come into my office and say, Coach, I don't know about this particular thing. I'm his boss. I can fire that little bugger. <laughs> but he comes into my office and he says, Coach, you know, this, this thing you're doing right here, you know, you know, and he, he was a little nervous. He said, but do you think maybe that's a little bit of your whiteness coming out? I thank God for Phil Jackson because he's one person at Lawndale 
that will tell me the truth. But he, but he loves me. He cares for me. When I, he can tell. When I walk into a room, Phil Jackson knows because he knows me well. We've been walking together for 15 years or so. He, know, he knows when there's a burden on my heart like nobody else. When I walk into the room, there's a woman that sits at our front desk by the name of Willette Grant. Willette Grant knows the word to say to me most more. She can tell. People, I, I wear my emotions out. You know, you can tell. You know, I can't hide something. But when she says, you know what? We've got to go deeper. And that, you only are able to go deeper when you're called. If you're not called to this, then that's okay. Sayonara. Take off. We don't need you. Which brings me to my next point, And that is desire. One of the basics of Christian community development is you've got to have a desire to do what you believe God has called you to do. You've got to want to do it. You've got to want to do it. I'm telling you, I want to do it. When I wrote Real Hope in Chicago, the first five words were, I love living in Chicago. I love living in Lawndale. I ain't no martyr. This is not something that I wake up in the morning and say, oh, can I live another day? Can I, can I, can I deal with these black folk in Lawndale one more day? If I wake up like that, I ought to say sayonara. I ought to get, I ought to be getting out of there. You see, I want, if you don't have a desire, I see Bruce Miller, our COO of, of the health center, and I make him so nervous sometimes. Because when we get the whole staff together, we don't even, I don't, well, here's a chair. I, this is what I do. Let me show you what I do. All right? I stand up on a chair. What, am I in the way, Noel? Be in the light. Let me enlighten myself. I stand up on a chair. And I say, if you don't love what you're doing, I don't care if you answer the phone. I don't care if you're cleaning the toilets. I don't care if you're a doctor. I don't care if you're a nurse. I don't care if, you're, if you don't love what you're doing. Quit. Quit. We don't need you here. And every once in a while, you got to have a little... I don't want anybody in Lawndale that doesn't have a deep desire to do what God has called us to do. And if you don't have desire to do what God is calling you to do or what you are doing back in your home, when you go home, put your house up for sale and leave the neighborhood. And I mean that. Because I don't care if only a hundred people come to CCDA. I want a hundred people who desire to do the things that God has called us to do. That's what I'm talking about. We need no martyrs in CCDA. If you're a black person and you can't stand that white person you're working with, don't be a martyr every day and say, I'm putting up with them. You go to them, you talk to them. And if that doesn't work out and you can't love what you're doing on a daily basis, goodbye. You leave. Have enough integrity to leave. And if you're a white person that's moved in to the hood and you feel guilty about it every day and you don't like it every day and you're there only because you think you've got to be there, it may be time for you to go on. We don't need martyrs. We need people who have a deep desire and a passion to do what God has called us to do. The next one is we must be determined. We cannot waver in the task that's before us. We must have determination. We must have a drive that we must make things happen. We have a responsibility all this stuff of just sitting around and talking and theorizing, that doesn't do much. Somebody told me once to talk is cheap. You see, we've got to have determination. And we've got to, if you're in a ministry and you've been there for 10 years and you're not seeing any results, you've got to do a heart check. You've got to do a check. Is this really where I'm supposed to be? We, why are you not having results? Why? Is it because you're not determined to get results? Is it that you're just, you're just kind of complacent just to be there? And look what I'm doing. Don't let too many people come around and see what you're doing. 
That's the, that's the hardest thing we have happening at Lawndale. Too many people want to come. I, and, 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 you know, and if you're in the CCDA family, I'm going to tell you what I start doing. There's about four or five people here that know this is true. We get calls all the time. People want to come and talk to us. I started this a few years ago. I just say, come to this, you know, here's what I tell them. I send them a little, sometimes I'll send them a book list of four or five books to read. And then I'll say, go to the next CCDA conference, whenever it is. And after you do that, then you can call me. Not that I'm all that, uh, but and all of us at Lawndale are all that. But you know what? We don't really have time just to be a showcase. Because all these people, we, 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 TV cameras come and film. They, they're a hindrance. They make us think we're something we're not. They make us think we're doing something in Lawndale. We ain't doing nothing. We ain't doing diddly squat. We, but we must have a determination. We must have a drive. We must have a drive to make... Some, when somebody is living in inadequate housing, we've got to have a determination. We, it cannot be quote-unquote ministry. We must have a determina- determined spirit with drive in our heart that we're going to make something happen. Against any barriers. It's our responsibility to get results. We are called to get results. I, I, I kind of reject that God doesn't call us to be successful. God calls us to be faithful. And I'm not a prosperity gospel guy. You know that. But you know what? I think we just lean back on that and say, well, you know, I ain't had nobody, you know, I haven't had anybody come to Christ in my ministry for the last 16 years. <laughs> Our church hasn't grown at all in the last year. We haven't, we haven't done anything for the last year. Nothing, it's like, well, what, what in the world is wrong with you? I don't believe it's God. I believe people are hungry. But I think sometimes we we get complacent. But I want us to be determined. I want you to have a little drive. You gotta have the call first. And I don't think it's it's drivenness or calledness. You don't we just don't have to argue. I, I, I know people argue about that. Are you called or are you driven? I think you gotta be both. I think you got to be called of God and then you have determination and you have some drive and you get up every day and you get out there and you do all that you can with all that you are to make some things happen. The next one is that we must be discoverers. We, we have to be a person that is working to discover more around us. Another word for this is we must be learners. In 1970, I know it dates me, but in 1970, I sensed a call of God to do what I'm doing today. I was a junior in high school. The first thing I did was I read a book. And the book my pastor gave me when I told him what I thought God was calling me to do. He gave me a book by Tom Skinner called Black and Free. He had just written it. I read that book. And when I read it, there was a question in the back of it. And if those of you that knew Tom knew that Tom didn't play. But in the back of the book, there was a question and answer time. And it says, one of the questions was, can white people work in the black community? Now, had Tom in his book said no, I don't know what would have happened in my life. But in the book, he said yes. And then he had a few little qualifiers that even as a 16-year-old boy... In Fort Dodge, Iowa, I heard that. But then for the next six or seven years, anytime I heard Tom Skinner was going to be anywhere, I went to hear him. I went to Urbana in 1970 only because Tom Skinner was there. And then Tom did workshops. I went to every one of his workshops. And in the midst of this, for the next probably 10 years, whenever Tom, I went to Wheaton, and, had, and whenever Tom would be in the Chicago area, I would go. And Tom didn't know who I was, but I would listen to his talk. But then after his talk was over, and everybody surrounded him with questions, I was right there as next to him as close as I could be, never asking a question. I didn't have enough sense to know what a good question was. I just listened. I listened. I listened at the feet of Tom Skinner for at least 10 years, every moment I could. And of course, when I met John, I mean, I am such a blessed person. 
I don't know how it happened. Well, I do know kind of how it happened. I left the room at the first CCDA conference, and I came back, and I was president. I mean, nobody else wanted it. I don't know if it was ordained of God or not, but I left the room, came back. I remember coming home to Honey, and I said to my Honey, I said, Honey, I said, I'm president of CCDA. She said, you're what? She said, we talk about these things. I know, and I, and I, and I, you know, and I, I don't know if I'm supposed to do it or not. She said, well, we got to pray about this. So I went back and said, I don't know if we're supposed to do this or not, but you know, I'll stay president until the next board meeting because there was nothing to do anyway. You can ask Bob Lupton, you know, for the, for the first 10 years of CCDA, when we were floundering, didn't do anything, the, the, we, we understood we had a do-nothing president, all right? And then we got some order to ourselves, and we still have a do-nothing president. But as the president of CCDA, one of the great, great blessings of my life, and I do not hold this lightly, is that I've had the opportunity of spending literally thousands of hours with John Perkins. Whenever John would speak, wherever we would go, we've been to many of your cities together, you'll know I'm always sitting right in that front row listening to everything. I could give some of his talks, but the amazing thing is, as I've heard, in fact, he gives some of mine once in a while. You know, that, that's when I knew I kind of arrived, but you, you, don't, you have your time. You're not coming back up here, all right? But, but every time I've heard him speak, and I mean this sincerely, and I've heard him speak a thousand times plus, every time God's spoken to my heart, often in a brand new way. It is so amazing. I, I don't know what to do with that. I'm scared. I'm scared that one day John won't be with us. I'm scared about that. I know I can't stand up here every morning and do those Bible studies the way John does, as much as I love the Bible and as much as I want to teach it. And I know I'm the one that's got all this stuff that he just in, put into me. And we're all Joshua and Joshua Etz. He's our Moses. And Vera May. I think it's so important that we pray for them. But we need to listen at their feet. I'm still at John Perkins' feet. I'm still listening to him. We may get to joke around a little bit. We may need to have a little fun together. But let me tell you, I'm at his feet learning from him every day. And I thank God for him. We have got to become learners, input. I want you to know, I don't come to CCDA to teach you. I really don't. And you might think, oh, he's just got this little cliche, but you need to hear this. I don't come, I, I cannot understand. When I hear somebody that doesn't come to CCDA and they don't really have a good reason for it, I'm clueless. I, how can you be doing Christian community development and not be here every year? I, don't, I, I'm, I can't, I've been to every one, but I've never once come out of obligation. I don't come to CCDA because I'm your teacher and to teach you. I come to CCDA to learn from you. I sit in workshops. I listen to the speakers. I'm a learner. We've got to be discoverers. And you've got to quit. Now, those of us who are here, we're talking about developing indigenous leadership. If you're here, you've probably already been somewhat developed. So it's time you take a little responsibility for developing yourself. Quit waiting for everybody to spoon feed you. You've got to start doing something. I have a luxury at Lawndale. I understand that. I have a great luxury. God has surrounded us in Lawndale with a great group of people. Every summer I take two months off and I don't preach on Sunday morning. This year, we had eight people in our congregation. Not all were pastors. Linda Jones, Linda Johnson, Darren Brown, Daryl Safor, Terrence Gadson, Stanley Ratliff, Joseph Atkins. Phil Jackson. They all preached one of those eight weeks. And during those times, instead of me preparing my message, which you, it takes hours every week to prepare a message, I take time off. I only go into the office a day and a half a week, and then I read. And I read about 20 books every summer in those two months, in three days a week. And I study, and I prepare, and I develop myself to become a deeper man of God 
This summer, I read a couple books. I want to show you a couple of them. The first, the first two books I read, put them up on the screen. Uh, I, I, I read a, a book about understanding poverty. And I want to teach you a little bit about how I read books, okay? Just so you, you know, not that it's any helpful to you, but I want to tell you how I do it. So there's this book out called A Framework for Understanding Poverty by Ruby Payne. And many of you have read it, and it's, it's a perspective. But when I read that with one hand, because I am in the African-American community, a discipline I have is that half the books I read in the summers, I want to be written by African-Americans. Okay, that's just how it, because I want to understand the African-American culture better and better every day. And I know, even though I'm a white man that's lived in an African-American community for 32 years, I still am not black and I don't think like an African-American. So I got to work every day to begin to even come close to having any kind of thought that might be relevant. So when I read Ruby Payne's book on understanding poverty, I read Jawanza Kanjufu's book on an African-centered response to Ruby Payne's poverty. So reading those together. Then the next two books I read were about reconciliation. And Reconciliation Blues, Edward Gilbreth. This, This book, Russ Knight is here. John Perkins is here. Russ Knight is uh, uh, from Chicago, a man that's, that's just had an unbelievable... Here's a whole chapter on Russ Knight in here and how Russ Knight, in a very quiet talk at Judson College, changed Ed, a black man's life, by what he said. There's a chapter on Tom Skinner. There's a, but this first book, Reconciliation Blues, is the story of a black man that's in a white evangelical world. If you're white, you've got to read this book. Because it helps you understand just a little bit of the mindset of what he's had to go through to be black in a white person's world. And then Rick Richardson and and Brenda Salter McNeil wrote the book about reconciliation, but it's about justice. Those are two on reconciliation. The heart of racial justice. Putting the word racial reconciliation, but also putting justice. We've got to do reconciliation that also has justice in it. That will get us away from that. And then I read two books that are kind of popular today, but I love them. I love them. And they're called uh, Now Discover Your Strengths. Uh, uh, And then the next one is Go and Put Those Strengths to Work. And the one about discovering your strengths... We should have a slide on that. But the one about discovering your strengths is that we, we, we discover our strengths and you go online and you, if you buy the book, you get to go online and, there, and it comes out with what are really your strengths. I got so excited about this. I had every staff member at Lawndale go on and take this and take this. I gave this book to all of our deacons and our outreach council board members and I had them all take it and we put it all together. We even had a little retreat about it as a staff to figure out because the goal is, is that you want to do what you're good at. That's what God made you you special, unique, just the way you are. You don't need to be a John Perkins. You don't need to be a Barbara Williams Skinner. You need to be who you are and who God created you to be. And the way you act in your community is going to be different than the way that we act. Because God made you unique just the way you are. But we've got to be discoverers. We've got to be people who know what it is that we're doing. And we've got to be learners. Whose feet are you setting at? Did you hear A.R. Bernard last night? A pastor of a church of 29,000. He said, friends here at CCDA, in case you don't know it, I sit at the feet of John Perkins as often as I can to hear the words of John. There's people in your cities that you could sit at their feet and learn. Maybe you've been doing workshops at CCDA. Maybe you're a board member. And you almost get the idea you know what's going on. We never stop being learners. The last one is direction. You got to know. We've got to know where we're going. We've got to know where we're going. We've got to have direction. Yes, you've got to have some goals. Yes, we must have vision statements, mission statements, setting goals. We cannot just do quote unquote ministry for ministry. In fact, I really don't like the word ministry. I really don't. I think it's such a condescending word. When somebody says to me, I'm going to go out and minister today, I say, oh, bah. You know? 
Jesus doesn't tell us ever to go out and minister. He tells us to go out and love. Now, if you say, I'm going to be with some, I'm going to hang out with some folks today. I'm going to love them. I'm going to be there. Oh, man, go on. But some of us just do ministry, and we just do it every day, but there's no direction. There's no goals. We, we wouldn't know if we accomplished what we were trying to do if we did it because we don't know where we're going. What is it you want? We wrote a vision statement for Lawndale uh, oh, about 20 years ago. And you know what? When you read this vision statement, you'll say, they'll never do that. Well, we probably won't. But we know if we ever get there, one of our goals is at the end of it is that every person, there's 50,000 people that live in North Lawndale, that every person in North Lawndale, it ends with, that would name the name of Jesus Christ as their Lord. So we won't be done in Lawndale until everybody in there names the name of Jesus as their Lord. Now, when we get that done, then I'm going to say, Jesus, I'm ready to go to heaven. But we, we must have some direction. It's okay to take a day and plan. It's okay to take some time and see where you're going. And we do this by using the eight key components. One of the ways you know where you're going is you listen to the community. You don't know what to do. I don't care if you're the same race as everybody in your community. If you walk in there thinking, this is what we're going to do, you're going to fail. It's Christian community development gathers the people together. And we listen to the people. The poem says, go to the people, live among them, learn from them. One of our eight key components is listening to the community. The felt need concept, asset-based community development, that we build on the positives that are already there. I went to the Willow Creek Leadership Summit this summer. Ann and I did, and Noel and Mary Ann, we four of us went together. There was a Harvard professor there named Michael Porter. He said something that just dug me deep in my soul. He's an expert. And he said, most of you churches and nonprofits, he said, and this is, these are exact words, I wrote it down. He said, at best, what you're doing, at best, you're ineffective. At best. What we do is that we are ineffective at best. But he said, at worst, You're destructive and make things worse. We often lack focus. We often just go through the motions. But if we don't know where we're going, we will never get there. And it is so important for us to listen to our community to set goals, to set direction, and to be focused. At Lawndale, I lost focus this past year. I did. It was a hard year for me. I totally lost focus. Our church is growing. More and more people are coming. And you know, when that that happens, I mean, you're excited about it, but we we run out of room on Sunday morning. So we went to three services. And and nobody wanted to come to 8 o'clock service. I didn't want to go either. I didn't want to be there at 8 o'clock. And so we start thinking about, well, you know, what should we do? And so we, we, we start looking at, you know, uh, where do we go? How do we go a per- particular direction? So we had lots of options. An old synagogue came up for sale in our community. And we thought about buying it, and we started praying about it, and a bunch of our leaders go through it, and we're praying. And then somebody came in and bought it out from under us. So we couldn't get that synagogue. Then the next thing happened is that there's an old movie theater Seats a couple thousand people. It's dilapidated. It was built in 1913, I think it was. It's dilapidated. It's fallen apart, but it's still there. And we started getting this idea. I love 2 Corinthians 5.17 that says that we rebuild broken things, that Christ is in the business of taking old dilapidated things and turning them into something new. And so I got all excited about it because I like to do that. But then as a church, I didn't truly have direction as the pastor that I wanted to do it and there's a difference between wanting to do it and believing God tells you to do it I could not stand before our congregation and say let's do this so when we took a vote I said please pray we tried to give a balanced approach whether to buy it or not to buy it please pray 
and let God lead you as to what you're going to do and whether we should buy this old movie theater. And it was, it was, a, it was a few blocks away from our Ogden campus, which was probably a factor that we shouldn't buy it. But I just love rebuilding old buildings. That's the part of the developer in me. I love it. And we took a vote, and the vote was a 50-50 split. And we had said, if we didn't have at least 60% to the affirmative, we wouldn't do it. That shook my world because I really wanted to buy that theater. I really wanted to do it. But God used the body of Christ in Lawndale to show me, their pastor, that this was not the right thing to do. So then we start looking at all this. Our architect is here. He must, they, our architect, he's going to do a workshop today. But he, he, you know, don't, don't get him asking about dealing with us at Lawndale. Because they've, they've written up so many plans, plan after plan after plan, and we say we're going to do it, and then we don't do it. Because we kind of lost direct. What are we going to do? And so finally we settle on building a brand new gym that has two gymnasiums. We have one now. We're going to build two gyms, and then we're going to have our worship services in the gym. And so then, that sounded good. And then when we started pricing this out, you know, we had said maybe we could come up with $2 million to get some new place to, to, to worship in. But when they start putting this out, all of a sudden it says it's going to cost probably somewhere in the neighborhood on a low side $4 or $5 million, and it might cost as much as 7 to $10 million. I went to Africa. Jember, my sister's here. God did three things in my life. When I went to Africa... I've been to Africa three times now. My son Austin was with me. Austin summed it up when he spoke at Lawndale one Sunday morning. He said, when we went to Ethiopia, we walked through the slums. The people were lovely, gracious, and kind. But he said, the kind of poverty people were living with there, no human being should ever have to see. I didn't want to see that, Dad. And no human being should ever have to live like that. Austin and I in our hotel room in Kenya verbalized it together. And we said, you know, we can't do that. I knew that if I was the pastor of the church, we would not be able to build a four or five million dollar building. I couldn't pastor that church. And it wasn't an ultimatum. Second thing that happened, I read Shane's book. If you haven't read it, read it. And in that book, and I, he, he, he talks about so many things, but one of the things he talked about was his dialogue with a, a, a suburban church that was spending tens of millions of dollars on a new facility, and he's writing them, trying to talk them out of it. Even the head pastor, he's talking to them. I said, yeah, that's CCDA. We can't spend millions and millions of dollars on these things. And then thirdly, I read that book, Jim and Casper Go to Church. And what, that, what, what amazed them about the CCDA church was its lack of pretense, was its lack of professionalness, but that the people really loved God. I called a deacon and outreach council meeting the two boards of our church, and I shared my heart. And I said, I'm not saying we shouldn't do this, but I know that I can't do it. And they all agreed, no, we shouldn't do it. And then one night I was praying. One morning I was praying. And all of a sudden, God said, you are so stupid. <laughs> he really did. He said, you're a stupid idiot. Don't you know that you already have a gym in Lawndale? Don't you, he said, go, God kind of, you know, like, like John, I got him here, no voice, but it's like, go figure out how many chairs you could get in there. We get about 450 chairs where we meet now. I measured up the space, and you know what? We could get 850 to 900 people squished in this room. We can double our attendance in a building that we already own, we already have, so we have to buy some chairs, which cost us $13,000. <laughs> It's not air conditioned, so maybe next summer, if we're still there, maybe we'll put in another forty or fifty thousand dollars. Maybe at most we'll spend a hundred thousand dollars and double our space with something we already have. It's not fancy, 
But boy, there's plenty of room to grow. So we've been meeting in that room for the last three or four weeks. And it was then that I finally have focus to now teach the Word of God again. We can lose our focus sometimes. And I let buildings in Lawndale cause me to lose my focus. What might be in your ministry now that causes you to lose focus on the reason God has called you into existence? Now we can go back to the motto of Lawndale Community Church of loving God and loving people. We must have focus. We don't want to do more destruction with our ministry than we do good. Lord Jesus, I thank you for these, my sisters and my brothers that are here with us. I thank you for every person and every sacrifice that they made to come to the CCDA conference. Lord, I do not take lightly that they're here. I really appreciate them being in, 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 in ministry together with us. And so, Lord, we just commit our movement to you. We commit our own lives to you. We love you, Jesus. We thank you. Help us to do the things that you've called us to do. And we pray this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. What a great way to start the morning. Thank you, Coach, for that word. Um, it is time to go break bread together. On your way out, please grab an orange sheet. It will let you know where you can go network by region. Please go visit the booths. The people on this floor and downstairs, they feel lonely sometimes. So please, just go say hi at least. Um, there may be lunch served again like yesterday out um, at the kiosk to the left over here. Um, and also, salsa dancers and choir singers, please be here at 4 o'clock sharp. We'll see you at 6.30.